In this tutorial, we'll look at some of the basic image processing techniques in Adobe Photoshop. Let's start by opening a file. Let's go File, Open. And I've got a TIFF file of the Horsehead Nebula. We'll open that up. First thing you see is it's a pretty small image. And we can fix that by zooming in or zooming out using the Magnify tool over here on the toolbar. It wants to zoom in. To zoom out, you can hold the Alt key down and it goes a zoom out, zoom in and that gives you a better look at your image. And the other important thing to notice about this image is the histogram. Histogram shows you the values of brightness in the image. And here it's showing us that most of the values of the image are over towards the left end of the histogram, meaning they're dark, which is appropriate for an astronomical image since the background is mostly black. And that's going to be important to notice that so that we can adjust that later using levels and curves. The most common adjustment in Photoshop is called levels. You'll use this a lot on every image. So we're going to go to Image, Adjustments, and Levels. You can also hit Control L or Command L to bring that up. And what it shows you is the histogram. And you have three sliders. You have a black point slider, a midpoint slider, and a white point slider. Everything to the left of the black point slider is displayed in the image as black. Everything to the right of the white point slider is displayed as white. And what we want to do, and this is very important, is bring the back black point slider all the way up to the toe of this histogram curve, but not past it. If you bring it past it, you're clipping off some of your faint data, which sort of defeats the purpose of taking long exposures of our astrophotography. So you've gone to all this work, so don't throw away the data by moving the black point slider past the toe of the histogram. White point slider we can move to brighten things up, but you don't want to overexpose anything and wash anything out. If we go too far, you can see these areas of the horsehead nebula here, excuse me, the flame nebula here becoming washed out. The horsehead still looks okay. So we'll just back that off touch. The midpoint slider can be used to bring out faint detail or darken the background, but without clipping any data, so that's important to know. Click OK, and there's the adjusted image. Another common adjustment we can make in Photoshop is called Curves. To do that, we'll go to Image, Adjustments, Curves. You can also hit Control-M or Command-M to bring that up. And here you see the histogram again. And this time we have a line diagonally across the center of the Curves window. And you can make adjustments to the endpoints. And this basically does the same thing as levels, brightening or darkening the image. But the important thing with Curves is that you can adjust the shape of this line and you can bring up the brightness of an image without adjusting the endpoints, without losing any of your bright or faint detail. You can also create multiple points. You can increase the contrast of an image by creating sort of an S-curve. You can lower the contrast by reversing the S-curve and generally do all sorts of really horrible things to an image. So you want to sort of go easy on it, but usually punching up the middle of the curve a little bit here brings out some more detail in the image without really washing out any of the bright detail or losing any of the faint detail. Another adjustment we can make is color balance. And usually color balance is done beforehand on an image in a program like Maxim DL, but if you still need to tweak things, Photoshop makes it very easy to do. You can go to Image, Adjustments, and select Color Balance. And you'll see you have three sliders. You have red, green, and blue sliders, and you have the opposite colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. The way this works is if you want to add image, red to the image, you're subtracting cyan from the image, and the other way around. If you add cyan to the image, you're subtracting red from the image. And so you can adjust these to change the color balance however you like. And you also can adjust shadows, midtones, or highlights separately. If you only want to change the color balance of the background of an image, such as the, the black sky background here, make that a nice neutral gray or black color, you can adjust the shadows and that'll affect that portion of the image. If you want to change the highlights of an image, the brighter regions here and here, you can change that using the highlights portion of the sliders. Now some of the real magic of Photoshop. We can see I've zoomed in on part of the image here, and we've got a couple pixel defects here, 
and artifacts like this bright blooming spike from the star. And we're going to get rid of those using the clone stamp tool. So come over and select the clone stamp tool right here. And the way this works is you're going to select part of the image to duplicate and then paste it over the part of the image you want to get rid of. And there's a little bit of an art to this, so we'll sort of see how it works. You can adjust the size of the brush up here at the top, brush size, bigger or smaller. And to select a portion of the image, you press the Alt key and click, and we're going to copy that part of the image on top of whatever we click on next, and we've gotten rid of that. Now the trick, if we undo that, the trick is you can't just grab any part of the image. If we grabbed over here in this red part of the nebula, duplicated that, and plopped it here, we've just painted a little pink spot onto our black background. So we'll undo that, and you want to copy from a very nearby area so that it looks nice and smooth. And that really becomes apparent when we try to get rid of this big blooming spike. It runs right through this bright star, it runs through this halo around the star, so we've got to be careful when we're getting rid of this. For the most part, we can select an area nearby and just sort of paint down over it. And that works pretty well, except that we've duplicated this faint star here, and we can go back in and get rid of that if we want. And then here we've got to be a little more careful as we touch up around this star grabbing the right areas, and watch where your crosshairs are so you don't get too close to an area that you don't want to duplicate. And we can come down the image and see the rest of this blooming spike, and get rid of some of that here. It starts to run through this blue nebula, so we can sort of select where we are here. It's all just, it's very much more art than science, so you've got to play around with it, and that's a great thing about Photoshop, of course, is if you mess something up, you can very easily undo it and go back. Nothing is nothing is permanently damaged here. And the last little bit, and we'll go back to the magnify tool and zoom out so we can see the whole image, and it's nicely cleaned up. You may want to resize your image for the purposes of displaying on a website or emailing to friends, especially if it's a large image file. And the way you do that is to go to Image and select Image Size, and it brings up the dialog box. It shows you the current size of the image, and we can change that. Typically something around, say, 800 by 600 or so is appropriate for displaying on the website. As long as these are linked here on the right, it'll automatically change the height to match the width in terms of aspect ratio so that the image stays the same proportions. Click OK. The image has been resized. If you want, you can now zoom in on it to see it at full resolution. Currently this file is in a 16-bit TIFF format, which is a great way to save files to preserve as much data as possible, but it's a lousy way to email or post to a web page because the file size is very large. So when you finish doing all your adjustments, what you want to do is save the file as a TIFF, but then you'll want to save it as a JPEG in order to be able to put it on a website or email it. But with a JPEG you lose data. And if you save a JPEG repeatedly, you'll lose more and more data and the image will start to degrade. So it's always nice to save as a TIFF first so you can come back to that if you decide you want to make more adjustments later. If to save as a JPEG, we have to change to an 8-bit format from 16-bit. So you can do that under Image, Mode, 8 bits per channel. And you'll see up at the top here, this now indicates that it's an 8-bit image. Then go to File, Save As, and in the format, you're going to select JPEG and click Save, and a dialog box comes up and asks you what quality you want to use for the image. Typically 7 or 8 is pretty good. It compresses the image enough that the file size isn't very big. In this case it indicates over here that it's 110 kilobytes, but it still leaves the image looking pretty nice. If you crank it all the way up to 12, you'll have a much better looking image, but it's also 520K, which is not too bad, but it's getting a little big, especially if you're displaying a lot of images on a page. If you go too low, you can see the image becomes pixelated and pretty nasty looking, so 7 or 8 is usually a pretty good choice. Click OK, now your image has been saved and it's ready to put up on a website or email to all your friends.